And so thank you so much, Melanie and Robin, for uh, inviting me to be in this very, very special day uh, to celebrate uh, Warner's accomplishments. And um, I guess I'm going to be uh, illustrating the method you know, that Roma's actually uh, 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 mentioned a little bit earlier today. And so um, I guess a little bit of a background for me. So when I joined uh, Warner's lab in 2005, um, I've been working on this field called viral evolution. Um, it sounds prestigious, but what it really entailed for me was um, um, working on poop samples of chimpanzees. So I, I basically worked with hundreds and hundreds of uh, you know, poop samples uh, from Africa and you know, trying to find you know, viruses that are uh, related to HIV to figure out its origins. Um, but after a while, it got kind of old and it's like, um, maybe I need something different. <laughs> and so uh, the path that was laid out for me when I actually uh, interviewed with Warner um, in his jag going through the hills of San Francisco um, was named uh, Apobec 3. So um, I'm going to illustrate some of the work that we've done uh, with, uh, with, Arnold, with Warner during that time. So it was a very competitive time. So this is a slide from John Carroll. Um, and I think everybody much, pretty much uses this slide uh, when they illustrate you know, what Apobecs are. And so um, Warner, at that time when I joined the lab, um, Kim Stopak was here. They figured out that this HIV-1 protein, VIF, um, actually um, um, uh, interacts with Apobec, leading to its degradation. Now, if you remove um, Apobe um, uh, VIF, what happens is that this uh, Apobec protein gets incorporated into virus particles, as um, elegantly demonstrated by Vanessa, somewhere here, Vanessa Soros. Um, and in the next target cell, uh, that Apobec actually inhibits virus replication, um, uh, reverse inscription, and also leading to error catastrophe of the virus. So as I mentioned, this is a very competitive field uh, when I joined Warner's lab. Uh, but there's also a lot of complexity because uh, there are seven human apobex uh, encoded in the genome. Um, but uh, in mice, interestingly enough, there's only one apobex. So um, uh, illustrating um, Warner's um, like instincts. So he actually made a mouse um, that um, had a knockout of this particular gene. And so when I joined his lab, um, my goal was uh, to, my project was to figure out, you know, is there a phenotype in these mice? Um, and obviously, I didn't really have a lot of background in terms of mouse immunology, but I, I was up for the challenge. Um, so, but in 2007, something happened, and um, Susan Ross and Mattia, actually here in the audience, uh, published a seminal paper in Nature that if you infect mouse apobec knockout mice, they, with mouse memory two more virus, uh, they have a lot more infection. And so um, I remember going to Gladstone and seeing this banner, best place for postdocs to work. And it's like, no, I'm not, <laughs> because I just got scooped. <laughs> and so, um, so what, that what happened is then I started looking at looking back. And so what do I do now? Um, and basically did a lot of PubMed searches. And um, I came across one paper uh, in the Journal of Virology published in 1995. Um, and just two words caught my attention. It's called chromosome 15. So, um, well, that is where Apobec is located, our mouse Apobec. And so I started pitching a crazy idea uh, to Warner. And surprisingly, you know, well, he did say that, well, who's going to be interested in this gene? You know, this is, you know, maybe just a small subset of mouse retrovirologists will be interested. But, you know, he did the, the remarkable thing, I thought, at that time, where he actually got me to uh, be in touch with the first author of this paper, Kim Hassenkrug, who's now a good friend of mine, uh, to train in terms of how to do mouse retrovirology work. Um, and so, well, when I went there in Montana, um, I, I realized that this gene is much more important than I initially thought, because it was actually described back in 1979 um, by this guy, Bruce Cheesebro, who is actually the director of the Rocky Mountain Labs. Um, and more interestingly, um, this gene controls the antiretroviral neutralizing antibody response. And so um, to make the long story short, I trained in, in, in their lab, um, in Kim's lab, and then went back to the Gladstone, and with uh, Mauricio's help and Bobby's help, um, we published in 2008 that this gene that um, Bruce um, identified back in 1979 um, is actually Apobec. And that really required me to do a lot of really old school um, uh, 
virology techniques like a focal infectivity assay, just so that I can match what Bruce did back in the 1970s. So that led to a really interesting connection between a restriction factor, ApoBec3, and the neutralizing antibody response. Um, and so um, um, during that time, I was able to, um, I got a junior faculty um, position at the University of Colorado. And really attesting to Warner's generosity of spirit, he, he said, you know, I'm not interested in mouse retroviruses. You can go work with that in Colorado. And so um, I'm happy to say, Warner, that there's some really interesting stuff going on right now where we're seeing some evidence that this gene might be editing antibodies. Um, so hopefully we can get that um, um, uh, published a little bit soon. Um, but what is also very interesting is, you know, if, if this has something to do with how we get better at neutralizing antibodies, can we regulate it? And so with Warner's background and all the cytokines, you know, that we got inundated with during lab meetings, um, it became clear that the ApoBex are actually regulated by these antiviral cytokines, the interferons. So that got me really, really interested in interferons. Two of them are FDA approved for clinical use, interferon beta for multiple sclerosis, interferon alpha-2 for, um, <clears throat> for hepatitis B and C infection. So, but as I mentioned, interferon alpha-2 is actually interesting because it's the only one that's FDA approved, but it's only one of uh, 12 different interferons that are encoded in our genome. Um, and and these interferons are all tandemly arrayed in chromosome 9, very similar and very analogous to the ApoBex uh, being tandemly arrayed. And they, they vary by about 24% in amino acid sequence. And we really barely know uh, the biology of the other interferons. Why do we have, well, this, so this is a puzzle, it's like why did we have, why did we evolve so many interferons? So the puzzle becomes more confounding when you think about the fact that, at least for the type 1 interferons, all of them signal through the same uh, receptor. Um, they trigger the same sim signaling pathway. They induce, induce similar genes. Um, and so why did we evolve so many of them? Um, and so one um, finding uh, from Gideon Schreiber's lab um, showed that these interferon alpha subtypes uh, bind with different binding affinities to the receptor and that those binding leads to differential regulation of the genes, differential restriction of viruses. So that makes a lot of sense, right? These like quantitative differences between these interferons. But it doesn't answer the question, so why do you have weak interferons at all? You know, why can't they just all signal the same way and inhibit viruses the same way? So we thought maybe there are qualitative differences between them. So this is the stuff that we started working on um, and we use transcriptomics to actually uh, figure this out. So what we did was basically get um, a, a bunch of interferons, treat primary CD4 T cells um, with a dose that we know triggers the same amount of the canonical ISGs or interferon stimulated genes. And what we found is that interferon beta induced uh, a lot more um, genes than the individual interferon alpha uh, subtypes. And within the interferon alpha subtypes, we found that there are actually some genes that appear to be more specific uh, to specific subtypes like alpha-5 and alpha-14 induced 200 um, extra genes that were not induced by the other interferons. So we thought this is potential evidence that there may also be qualitative differences uh, between the interferons and may be relevant to, uh, to Bob's um, hypothesis that were presented earlier. So if there are qualitative differences, how come there are qualitative differences? Well, I guess every virologist here in the audience could agree that this world really belongs to viruses and we just live in it. Um, when you think about the diversity of all the viruses, they have different replication machineries, they have different target cells, they have different pathogenesis. So wouldn't it be like, it's probably not a stretch of the imagination to think that the interferons uh, evolved to counteract very specific uh, virus families. So how do we test this hypothesis? Um, so one step so, um, is to figure out you know, which interferons best inhibit HIV. Um, but we also re we really wanted to know, um, we, we needed another virus you know, to, to test again. So when, SARS, the, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, it made a lot of sense to also work on SARS-CoV-2. Um, so our work in HIV was really influenced by Warner 2 in, in a way where 
Um, you want to really prioritize your work um, uh, focusing on physiologically relevant models of infection. And so um, he's been working a lot with this human lymphoid aggregate culture or HLAC system. And I guess one of the method is to get something catchy. So when I, and when I went to uh, uh, Colorado, I, I realized that some of my colleagues there are working with gut samples and they're infecting that with HIV. So we decided, and I suggested that we should call it the Lamina Propria Aggregate Culture, or LPAC, um, sort of as a parallel to the HLAC model. So um, in this model, we basically get gut tissue, and then we disaggregate them. And in this experiment, what we did was to um, infect them with HIV in the presence um, of different interferon alpha subtypes, and then looked at uh, infection after a certain number of days. Um, so um, the, the findings from this work revealed that some interferon alpha subtypes, such as 6, 14, and 8, appear to be more potent at inhibiting HIV as compared to, let's say, the FDA-approved interferon alpha 2. Um, so um, similar data was published by Ulf Dittmer um, using humanized mice um, and also PBMCs from uh, uh, Roberto Speck's uh, group in Switzerland. Um, so what about SARS-CoV-2? Um, we still don't have a really physiologically you know, relevant model, but so we decided to just work with an alveolar type 2 epithelial cell line uh, that we transduced with a codon-optimized version of ACE2. And then we treated them with interferons um, and then infected with different strains of SARS-CoV-2. And then after 24 hours, uh, just looked at the amount of RNA in the supernatant. So this is a representative, exam, um, a representative data showing that different interferons actually had different abilities or potencies against the virus. Um, and when we did, so we did four different strains of lineage B isolates, which is the, the most prevalent SARS-CoV-2 strains. And um, we see here a hierarchy where, let's say, uh, alpha-8, interferon beta, omega, and alpha-5 uh, were the most potent um, against uh, SARS-CoV-2. So since we use the same interferons against, um, uh, for, H for the HIV work and the SARS-CoV-2 work, um, uh, for, these were like recombinant interferons from Sid, uh, Sid Peska's um, um, com company, uh, PBL Assay Science. Um, we were um, surprised to see that there's really no uh, strong correlation. I mean, the same interferons that are the best and the worst um, um, were found, but within the middle, we can't really see a, a strong correlation. Um, so this is another way of showing that, where, um, let's say, interferon alpha-6 is one of the most potent interferons that we found against HIV, but it's one of the weakest against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, by contrast, interferon alpha-5 is really potent against SARS-CoV-2, but is one of the weakest against um, HIV-1. So uh, to conclude um, uh, those findings, what we I'm show, I've shown you is that the human genome uh, encodes uh, diverse interferons that trigger um, common and distinct gene expression profiles. Um, the subtypes of interferon alpha that most potently inhibit HIV-1 may, may not be the same for SARS-CoV-2 and versa, vice versa. Uh, in, and in data that I don't have time to show, uh, we've also uh, found that um, SARS-CoV-2 may be evolving uh, to become more resistant to the interferons. And data from Beatrice Sun and Catherine Barr's group show that um, interferons may also, um, um, uh, HIV-1 may also resist interferons. So the implications is that the human interferons may have evolved to counteract diverse virus pathogens, and preparing for the next virus pandemics may benefit from an, a deeper understanding of their biology. Um, so this is my lab. When I actually moved to Denver, it felt like going to California. We now have a Trader, Joe, Trader Joe's. We have an in and out there right now. Um, but I really have to thank Warner for, um, for giving me the opportunity to actually um, pursue um, some of these ideas. And without him, a lot of this work wouldn't have uh, blossomed. And so I really hope that um, with, you know, that, that with Warner will have a little bit more time um, to actually pursue some of our, his in, other interests. And um, if I have a word to describe Warner, I would say I would pick the word coach. So I would say Warner is our scientific coach. Um, and Warner, hopefully in, in, in the coming years, uh, you will have more time to do, you know, to pursue your passion in cars. And I know Nadja showed, you know, mentioned that, you know, you might not like mini golf, but I have evidence that you were teaching us mini golf. <laughs> 
So that's Warner right there teaching Robin, Nate, and Jason how to play golf. But thank you so much, Warner, for everything.